one, two, three. Testing one, two, three. This is Radio Free Mormon on the air, broadcasting behind enemy lines. Tonight's episode: Quacku, the Deceiver. Who on earth is Quacku? You might ask. Some of you may already know Quacku is the name, the first name of one of the rising generation of Mormon apologists. His last name appears to be L-E-L, but his first name is Kwaku, K-W-A-K-U. He has appeared on Mormon videos such as the three Mormons in which he and two other youthful Mormons gather together to discuss different elements of Mormon apologetics. He has now branched off on his own to making videos featuring only himself. So that's who Kwaku is. Why do I call him Kwaku the Deceiver? Well, the reason why is because my attention was drawn to a recent video that Kwaku put up in which he seeks to prove the book of Abraham is true. In fact, the name of his video is Proving the Book of Abraham is True. This video was posted on Friday, July 19th, 2019, so it's very recent. I don't follow Kwaku, but this video was brought to my attention. And the reason it was brought to my attention is because of a recent series of podcasts that Bill Reel and I did back in December and January dealing with the absolute failure of apologetics in regards to the Book of Abraham. In part two of that series, I outlined a strategy, a deceptive strategy, commonly used by apologists in order to try and prove the Book of Abraham is true. The remarkable thing is that seven months later, seven months after I outlined that deceptive apologetic strategy, here comes Kwaku the deceiver who is doing exactly what it is that I outlined. He is engaging in this exact same kind of apologetic deception, which is why he has earned the nickname of Kwaku the deceiver. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to play a somewhat edited version of the 15 minute segment. It was originally 15 minutes. It'll probably be edited down to something less than that. But this is Radio Free Mormon from December 23rd. That's when this podcast was posted, part two of the Book of Abraham series. December 23rd, 2018, in which I talk about this deceptive strategy. And then I'm going to play the audio from the video that Kwaku put up seven months later on Friday, July 19th, 2019, in which he employs this deceptive strategy, almost word for word to what I described seven months earlier. So here we go with Radio Free Mormon from December 23rd, 2018. Play the tape. Okay, well, unfortunately, the reason that apologists, including Daniel C. Peterson and others, you don't have to be an Egyptologist to engage in this type of analysis, go to trying to look for parallels in the Book of Abraham text with ancient parallels is once again because the Book of Abraham doesn't match the papyrus. If it did, that would be the end of it. Case closed. But once again, we get further and further afield trying to prop up the inspiration and the revelation and the translation behind the Book of Abraham. And this is just another way of doing that. Now, if there were actual ancient stories that are reflected in the book of Abraham that Joseph Smith would have had no way of knowing about, well, I would have to admit, yes, that would speak to the inspiration of Joseph Smith in producing the book of Abraham, even if he thought he was translating the papyrus and wasn't, and yet is somehow producing a text with stories in it about Abraham that were known anciently, but not known in modern times, you know, that would be impressive. And that is the attempt to do what you're talking about. In fact, there's this massive book, and I mentioned it in part one. It's called Traditions About the Early Life of Abraham. This is the one that was compiled and edited by John Twetness, John Gee, Egyptologist, and Brian Hoglid. Let me give you an example. There are two primary stories about Abraham that are not in the Bible, but are produced in the book of Abraham as we have it, that are reflected in ancient texts. The first of these is the sacrifice of Abraham himself. We all know from the Bible that it wasn't Abraham who was sacrificed. It was Abraham who was commanded to sacrifice his son, Isaac. And that was uh, interrupted by the intercession of an angel right at the critical moment. But the Bible says nothing about Abraham himself having been attempted to be sacrificed. There are, however, 
ancient texts and stories about the sacrifice of Abraham. And once again, it's an attempted sacrifice of Abraham. These, however, do not involve a sacrifice with a knife by an Egyptian priest. Instead, they involve a sacrifice by being thrown into a fire. And the story very much resembles that of the three Hebrew children who were thrown into the fire as we find it in the book of Daniel. The story, and this was actually a rather famous story anciently about the attempted sacrifice of Abraham being thrown into the fire and being preserved by the Lord. Now, the problem is, Bill, the problem is that if that were only in ancient texts that were unavailable to Joseph Smith, and then it shows up in the book of Abraham, even though it's a different kind of sacrifice, you know, we could probably give a little room for error there. But the problem is, is that that story is not only an ancient text unavailable to Joseph Smith, but it's also in a text that was very much available to Joseph Smith. And what I'm referring to there is the book of Jasher. The book of Jasher seems to have some interest to Latter-day Saints, at least when I joined the church back in the 1970s and on into the 1980s, many members of the church had a copy of the book of Jasher on their bookshelves. It is an apocryphal book. It is referenced in the Old Testament as the book of Jasher. And apparently somebody came along and decided to write a book that matched the citation in the Old Testament. But at any rate, there is a book of Jasher. It was available to Joseph Smith. And in the book of Jasher, it mentions the story of the attempted sacrifice of Abraham. Once again, it's by his being thrown into the fire. Once again, he comes out alive. Once again, he's saved by an angel of the Lord. And once again, he is bound by linen cords. So the differences are that it's into fire and not by being cut with a knife, as in fact, simile number one. The other difference is that it's not being done by a priest of Pharaoh. It's being done by Nimrod, who is the king, not of Egypt, but of Babylon. Now, we'll get into this a little bit later because Ur, where this all takes place, is in Babylon. It's not in Egypt. And that's going to be another problem for the book of Abraham, which we'll talk about later. But right now, what I want to talk about is the fact that the book of Jasher was extremely popular in Joseph Smith's day. It was completely available to him. And this would be the likely source for Joseph Smith's understanding that a story existed about Abraham being attempted to be sacrificed in Ur of the Chaldees. And once again, the Chaldees just means in Babylon, in the land or city of Ur in Babylon, and probably for its appearance in the book of Abraham. Now, the second thing, the second uh, big hit that appears in the book of Abraham is where it talks about Abraham going to Egypt ultimately and sitting on Pharaoh's throne and teaching the principles of astronomy to the Egyptian court of Pharaoh. And actually the text of Abraham never gets to that. It sort of cuts off in the middle. It appears that maybe there was more that would come and it never did. But if you go to facsimile number three, facsimile number three illustrates a scene that one would expect to have been in the text of the book of Abraham if it had been completed, but which never was. If you look at facsimile number three, you'll see there's six explanations underneath it. Figure one says that Abraham is sitting upon Pharaoh's throne, and at the very bottom of the figures uh, and the explanations of the figures, it says this, Abraham is reasoning upon the principles of astronomy in the king's court. So that's how The book of Abraham preserves the idea that Abraham taught the principles of astronomy in the king's court. In other words, Pharaoh, king of Egypt. That story is also a bullseye because that story also appears in a number of ancient texts. Once again, like the book of Jasher, however, that story appears not only in ancient texts that were unavailable to Joseph Smith, but it also appears in another text that was very much available to Joseph Smith, and that was in Josephus. Now, Josephus is, oh, it's a series of books, actually. It was compiled by a Jewish historian. He lived in the first century. He compiled a history of his people going back to creation, going back and basically recapitulating much of the Old Testament, then taking it down through the Maccabees and up through what were to him modern times with the Romans and the destruction of the temple under Titus in approximately 70 CE or the Common Era. 
which is during the time that Josephus lived. So having said all of that, Josephus, of course, talks about Abraham in the first part of his history, because as I said, he's recapitulating the Old Testament, or I should say the Hebrew scriptures, and also adding in other stories that didn't make it into the Hebrew scriptures. And one of those stories is, guess what? Abraham reasoning upon the principles of astronomy to Pharaoh. So this is what he says in chapter 8. I think it's of his first book that it's talking about uh, the Egyptians. It's talking about Abraham. And it says he communicated to them arithmetic and delivered to them the science of astronomy. For before Abraham came into Egypt, they were unacquainted with those parts of learning. For that science came from the Chaldeans into Egypt and from thence to the Greeks also. So Josephus is the likely source, or at least it's a contemporary and available source to Joseph Smith for putting it into the book of Abraham. Josephus was not simply available in Joseph Smith's day. Uh, There is documented history in the church that Oliver Cowdery, I believe, had a copy of Josephus. So not only was it theoretically available to Joseph Smith, it was very close by and readily available to Joseph Smith. So my question would be, has the church made any kind of acknowledgement, RFM, on whether uh, this may have played a part in the book of Abraham? You're cracking me up with that one, Bill. Yes, absolutely. Thank you for the softball right across the plate. Yes, the church actually has. But you have to dig and dig and dig to find it. You know that the church put up the essay on the book of Abraham. I think it was in 2014 on the church website. So if you go to that essay, and I encourage you to do so, what you're going to find is that it's rather lengthy. It mentions some of these bullseyes, and I'll have to put that in quotation marks, unfortunately, as well as maybe some other, which are even worse than the ones we've talked about. And then there are certain footnotes that are mentioned because they also go to these stories that are talked about and the connection with the ancient world. Now, this essay has 46 footnotes. And at the very end, the last sentence, actually the last two sentences of the last footnote, if you look really close and put on your reading specs, Bill, you will find this in the fine print. Quote, some of these extra biblical elements were available to Joseph Smith through the books of Jasher and Josephus, period. That's what they hide at the very end of the last footnote of the essay on the church website. Now, they do add this. This is the very last sentence. After saying some of these extra biblical elements were available to Joseph Smith through the books of Jasher and Josephus, they add this apologetic note. Joseph Smith was aware of these books. Oh my gosh, they actually say he was aware of these books. This isn't looking good, Bill. They say Joseph Smith was aware of these books, but it is unknown whether he utilized them. Do you, do you mind if I pipe in here? No, go ahead. Uh, here's, what bo- here's what bothers me. They, once you say, look, Joseph Smith was definitely aware of them. He's aware of these books. There's, there's no ifs, ands, or buts. And that's what the church is saying here. He was aware of these books. But whether he used them or not in the translation of the book of Abraham, that we can't say. That we don't know. What I would say is that when you recognize the church acknowledging this much, you are not even a hop, skip, and a jump away from what Joseph Smith did here being very similar to what he did with Adam Clark's commentary. Yes, and we know from the Adam Clark commentary and the Joseph Smith translation and Joseph Smith's use of the former in creating the latter that he was very, very open to using modern sources in order to help him with his translations. I think that's probably the nicest way I could put it, and incorporating elements from currently existing texts that he had with him into his newly created scripture. He did it with the Joseph Smith translation of the Bible. We know that now. And so it is not too much of a stretch to think that he would have been likely to do the same thing with other scriptural productions, including the book of Abraham. Let me tell you this one last apologetic trick, and I've seen this even recently in researching for this particular podcast, Bill. Here's the great apologist trick, is what you do is you use these stories from Josephus or the book of Jasher that occur in the book of Abraham. And what you do is you don't quote Josephus or Jasher. Instead, you quote other iterations of the same story in different texts that were not available to Joseph Smith 
And then you say, how could Joseph Smith have known? These stories are in texts that were not available to, to him, and yet here they appear in the book of Abraham. So that is Radio Free Mormon from December 23rd, 2018, setting forth the strategy, the deceptive strategy engaged in by some apologists in seeking to defend the truth claims of the book of Abraham. And here we have Kwaku the deceiver engaging in exactly that same kind of strategy from July 19th, 2019, seven months after I described this very strategy. I will play excerpts from Kwaku's 19 minute video on the subject. Remember, it is titled, Proving the Book of Abraham is True, so that you can see exactly what I'm talking about. Play the tape. Your testimony should not be negatively affected by anything anyone has said about the Book of Abraham. So I'm going to give a little rundown of how we got the Book of Abraham, uh, the translation process, and then the evidence for the Book of Abraham. Joseph Smith got his hands on some papyri and he basically translated the papyri and wrote the book of Abraham from that translation. The issue is when people look at the papyri that we have, they find that it does not match what the book of Abraham says, but for the most part seems to be some sort of Egyptian funerary scroll. But when you look into the book of Abraham more, you find that there are some things that are worth noting before you can just write it off. And once you find that, you then find that there is evidence for the book of Abraham. But let's examine the critical revisionist history of this, okay? If it is false, and Joseph Smith just made something up, then it should just be nonsense. Or it should just be some general story about Abraham that's just like the Bible. If Joseph Smith just made it up, then the unique claims of the book of Abraham, and by unique I mean the things in the book of Abraham that are not found in the Bible. Those claims about Abraham. Theoretically, those claims should just be nonsense. And we should not be able to find any crossover between those claims in the book of Abraham and any claims in ancient manuscripts or Jewish documents regarding Abraham. But the fact that the unique claims of the book of Abraham can be verified by other ancient Jewish texts that Joseph Smith did not know about and were not translated into English until far after the book of Abraham was published, that is what makes it compelling. That's why we know Joseph Smith was a prophet. The fact that it may not match but is still true shows that there was a divine work that went into Joseph Smith's translation process, and that's really cool. So remember, if the book of Abraham is false, there should not be any crossover between its unique claims that are not found in the Bible and other ancient documents. But there are. In fact, there are so many, I don't think it's possible that I could ever discount the book of Abraham as being true scripture. In fact, there is so much evidence and crossover, I can't present it all in this video, but I can give a few of them. There is an old Eastern manuscript called the Chronicles of Jeremiel, and it contains a lot of things about Abraham. It's super old and was not translated and published in English until 1899. The Book of Abraham was published in 1835, so Joseph Smith did not have any access to the Chronicles of Jeremiel. So there's one unique claim in the Book of Abraham. It's that Abraham was going to be sacrificed by priests because he wouldn't worship the idols of his father Terah. This is not found in the Bible. We know in the Bible that Abraham was supposed to sacrifice his son Isaac, but there's nothing in the Bible about Abraham himself being sacrificed in an altar for not worshiping the false gods of his father. But that is found in the book of Abraham. It's another unique claim and people are going, where is Joseph Smith getting this from? God. So yes, Abraham is going to be sacrificed because he will not worship the idols of his fathers. In the Chronicles of Jeremiel, the exact same thing happens. He's going to be put into a furnace. Now in the book of Abraham, he's going to be killed on an altar. In the Chronicles of Jeremiel, he's being put into a furnace. There could have been an altar in that furnace, and this ancient furnace being this room where they're just going to set him on fire, right? But what we can take is that he's going to be killed because he won't worship these idols. This is a very specific, unique claim. Abraham himself in the book of Abraham is saying, I was going to be sacrificed on an altar because of it. And the Chronicles of Jeremiel, they're saying they're going to light him on fire because of it. Abraham's saying sacrifice, Chronicles are saying lit on fire, but the Chronicles are not exactly from Abraham. But that's not only that he's going to be sacrificed for not worshiping these idols, which is already a bullseye. He gets rescued by an angel. He gets rescued at the last minute by an angel. 
How cool is that? So in the book of Abraham, an angel comes down and saves him at the last moment from being sacrificed. And in the Chronicles of Jeremiah, an angel as the Lord comes down. But it's not just in the Chronicles of Jeremiah that it says that, it's in another book too. Tarjum Jonathan Genesis. It's another ancient Eastern book um, talking about Abraham. In fact, Tarjum Jonathan Genesis is talking about all of Genesis and gives a little bit more information and some different information that's found in the Bible. And it says this, And he said to him, I am the Lord who brought thee out of the fiery furnace of Kasdai to give thee this land to inherit. So what we have in the book of Abraham is Abraham about to get sacrificed, an angel comes down to save him, and then the Lord says, I have rescued you. These are not found in the Bible. These are only found in other ancient works Joseph Smith did not know about and in the book of Abraham. In Abraham 1.20, we see that the altar or the furnace is actually destroyed after Abraham is delivered from it and after he is saved. This specific situation is found in a lot of manuscripts. I'm going to read one. It's in Pseudo Philo. And Abram arose out of the furnace, and the fiery furnace fell down, and Abraham was saved. In Abraham 1.20 it says, And the Lord broke down the altar of Elkanah and all the gods of the land, and utterly destroyed them, and smote the priest that he died. Also, fun fact, the priest who's trying to kill Abraham, being smitten, being destroyed, is also found in other ancient manuscripts too. Now, of course, one of the most unique claims of the book of Abraham is the astrology. Kolob and Kokob and Olea and all that stuff and how Abraham sees the stars and he sees the firmament and he basically God essentially lets him look into space and see all these things. It's a really beautiful and amazing part of the book of Abraham. The issue is it's not really found in the Bible. The only thing found in the Bible is when God tells Abraham that his descendants will be numbered like the stars. This is a very unique part of the book of Abraham and people think again Joseph Smith just made that up. But in other ancient manuscripts, this seems to be a recurring theme of Abraham having information about the stars and how he's exercising that information. So in the book of Abraham, we, we have God just telling Abraham all about the stars. In the Chronicles of Jeremiah, we have something similar. In the Chronicles of Jeremiah, it says, And Abram was rich in cattle, silver, gold, and in all the wisdom of Hermetica and astrology, which he had acquired in Egypt from Pharaoh's magicians, so that there was none so wise as he. From Egypt, these scientists spread over Greece, and Abraham was able to foretell the future by observance of the stars, and he was very wise in astrology. So the claims here is that he knows all, he knows astrology, he knows, you know, stuff about the stars and stuff, but that he also picked it up in Egypt by the magicians. In the book of Abraham, he's saved from sacrifice by the Egyptians, and right after, God opens the heavens and shows him the stars. So Abraham gets this information in Egypt, or right outside of Egypt, by his own admission, but when someone else is telling the story, they're basically saying, yeah, he picked it up in Egypt by the Pharaoh's magicians, but that guy didn't know that it wasn't the Pharaoh's magicians, it was God. But again, we see this crossover of Abraham being given information about the stars. This isn't found in the Bible, but it's found in the book of Abraham and other ancient manuscripts. And by the way, this is not it. This is not all the coincidences of things that line up with the book of Abraham and other scriptures. There's so much more. Ask yourself this question. If Joseph Smith was just making it up, what are the odds he could get this stuff right? What are the odds he would know that Abraham himself was going to be sacrificed? And specifically going to be sacrificed because he would not worship the idols of his father. How would he know that the thing they were going to kill Abraham on was going to be destroyed after Abraham would be rescued by an angel? How would he know that Abraham was taught astrology? Specific, unique astrology. How would Joseph Smith know any of those things? The information was not available to him. Everything that I've quoted to you and showed in this video are things that were translated into English after the book of Abraham was published or after Joseph Smith died. So you have to ask yourself this question. How could Joseph get it right? Was he a liar or was he a prophet? It's one of the two. The book of Abraham was translated exactly by the papyri we have. It would not be interesting, would it? It would just mean Joseph translated something. But the fact that it may not match but is still accurate and authentic to history shows that there is a translation process going with God and Joseph that has benefited all of us. And I am thankful that we have the words of Abraham so plainly and purely given to us by God through Revelation. So there we have Mormon apologist Kwaku L proving the truth of the book of Abraham in his video posted July 19th, 2019 that follows almost exactly the playbook that I outlined seven months earlier in December of 2018. He even uses the term bullseye. It is almost as if Kwaku listened to my podcast showing how this deceptive maneuver is employed by Mormon apologists on behalf of the Book of Abraham, and then decided, oh, what the hell, I'm going to give it a crack anyway. I'll see if I can deceive my listeners in exactly the way as described by Radio Free Mormon.
Once again, here's that quote from me describing this subterfuge. Play the tape. Let me tell you this one last apologetic trick, and I've seen this even recently in researching for this particular podcast, Bill. Here's a, the great apologist trick, is what you do is you use these stories from Josephus or the book of Jasher that occur in the book of Abraham. And what you do is you don't quote Josephus or Jasher. Instead, you quote other iterations of the same story in different texts that were not available to Joseph Smith. And then you say, how could Joseph Smith have known? Wow. Sometimes I amaze myself. So before I conclude this podcast, I want to talk a little bit about sources. The first has to do with the sources that Kwaku the Deceiver used in his video regarding the Book of Abraham. You already heard how he scrupulously avoided any mention of the Book of Jasher or of the histories of Josephus in his video and instead went to other documents recapitulating the same stories that were found and or translated into English after Joseph Smith died in 1844. Kwaku quoted from a book called The Chronicles of Jeremiel. He also quoted from a document titled The Targum, Jonathan. And at one point in his video, he put up on the screen a quote from another book, the Book of Jubilees. Although he did not actually mention the Book of Jubilees while he was talking, he did put a quote from the Book of Jubilees up on the screen while he was speaking. And at the end of his quote from the Book of Jubilees, it said this was not translated into English until 1946. That is the point with all of these quotes. They were not found or translated into English until well after Joseph Smith died. In the case of the Chronicles of Jeremiel, it was not translated into English until 1899. And a similar notation was put up on the screen with reference to the third text used in this video, the Targum Jonathan. Now, I will tell you where it is that Kwaku almost certainly got his information for these different stories relating to Abraham. And they are compiled in a very thick book called Traditions About the Early Life of Abraham. This is the same book that I mentioned at the beginning of my quote from December's podcast that I played at the beginning of this podcast. This book is approximately 569 pages long. And the entire intent of the book is to collect stories about the life of Abraham from a variety of different texts, from a variety of different religions. The first subsection is earliest traditions about the early life of Abraham. The next section is Jewish traditions about the early life of Abraham. Then it goes to Christian traditions about the early life of Abraham. And then finally, Muslim traditions about the early life of Abraham. And then finally, there's a catch-all toward the end called other traditions about the early life of Abraham. And then there are various appendices at the end of the book. This book was published by the Foundation for Ancient Research and Mormon Studies in 2001. And all of the works cited by Kwaku come from the first part of this book under Jewish traditions about the early life of Abraham. The thing that is interesting to me is that the documents cited to by Kwaku in his video are in close proximity to the documents that are not cited to by Kwaku in his video. In other words, the Book of Jubilees, the Chronicles of Jeremiel, and the Targum Jonathan are all contained in this book, and they are very close in proximity to Josephus and the Book of Jasher. For instance, the Book of Jubilees, and once again, the entire books are not printed in this book, only extracts from various books and documents are printed in this book, those extracts having to do with stories and traditions related to the early life of Abraham. The extract from the Book of Jubilees used in the video is found on pages 14 through 20 of this book. Josephus or extracts from the Book of Josephus is found on pages 47 through 49 of this book. The extracts from the Targum Jonathan are found on pages 65 through 67 of this book. The extracts from the Chronicles of Jeremiel are found on pages 129 through 134 of this book. And interestingly, the extracts of the Chronicles of Jeremiel occur immediately before the extracts from the book of Jasher, which commence on page 135 of this book. So if Kwaku used this book in order to get his source documents, and it seems quite likely to me that this is what he probably did because this is the preeminent collection of documents related to stories and traditions about the early life of Abraham for apologists. It is hard for me to believe that he zeroed in on the Targum Jonathan, the Chronicles of Jeremiel, and the Book of Jubilees, and somehow managed to miss the Book of Jasher, and the History of Josephus, which are found in close proximity and interspersed among the documents that Kwaku did choose to use. 
To put a fine point on it, it looks like Kwaku is winnowing his sources and being very careful to select only those documents that talk about these stories from Abraham's life that were translated into English after Joseph Smith died, and to make a point of avoiding those documents contained in the same book in close proximity, which were translated into English and which were available to Joseph Smith. The reason for this seems obvious. Kwaku knows that if he includes citations to the book of Jasher and the history of Josephus, that will undercut the main thrust of his argument, which is how could Joseph Smith have known? Well, if he includes the book of Jasher and Josephus, then the answer is obvious. That's how Joseph Smith could have known. It appears that Kwaku, at a very young and tender age, has already sold his soul for apologetics and is willing to go a bridge too far and actually intentionally deceive his audience to make a point that a full examination of the relevant documents would not support. In fact, there is one point in his video that I'm going to replay for you right now where Kwaku actually says that there were no documents available to Joseph Smith from which he could have found out about these stories. Now, that is significant. It is one thing to skew the truth, to spin the information, to play hide the ball, and to cite to these other sources that were available only after Joseph Smith's death and not talk about the ones that were available during his life. It is another thing entirely to go the extra mile and actually say point blank that there were no documents that were available to Joseph Smith that did mention these stories. Here's the part in Kwaku's video that I'm talking about. Play the tape. These are not found in the Bible. These are only found in other ancient works Joseph Smith did not know about and in the Book of Abraham. So you see, that's the part where Kwaku gets himself in trouble. He out and out says that these were found only in other books that Joseph Smith did not have access to and in the Book of Abraham when in fact they were also found in books that Joseph Smith did have access to. And once again, those are the books of Jasher and the history of Josephus. Now, another point that I want to make about sources, I have talked previous to this in rather vague terms about the fact that there are documents that show that Joseph Smith did have access to and was aware of both the book of Jasher as well as the history of Josephus. I want to take a couple of minutes now to document this fact in case there's anybody out there who thinks I'm just making this up or overstating the case or, God forbid, actually lying to you like Kwaku just did. If you go to the Joseph Smith Papers Project, as I am now, go to the search function on the home page, type in the word Jasher, J-A-S-H-E-R, it'll come up with nine results for the word Jasher. Now, a number of these results are not really relevant for our purposes. However, if you scroll down to the one that's titled Times and Seasons, 1 September 1842, page 902, and click on that, we will find on that page of the Times and Seasons, the LDS periodical in Nauvoo, on the date of September 1st, 1842, a reference not only to the book of Jasher, but also a reference to the contents of the book of Jasher. This is in the context of setting forth the different biblical and ancient people who suffered for their faith and were martyred either by being sacrificed or attempted to be sacrificed. Here's what it says. Abel was slain for his righteousness, and how many more up to the flood is not of much consequence to us now. But if we believe in present revelation, as published in the Times and Seasons last spring, Abraham, the prophet of the Lord, was laid upon the iron bedstead for slaughter. And the book of Jasher, which has not been disproved as a bad author, says he was cast into the fire of the Chaldees. Now notice this. The book of Jasher and the contents of the book of Jasher, and specifically the story about Abraham being cast into the fire of the Chaldees, as contained in the book of Jasher, was known to the editors and the writers of the Times and Seasons at least as early as September 1st, 1842. And in this very article, it refers to the Book of Abraham being published earlier that spring of 1842. So this is within approximately five to six months after the Book of Abraham account of Abraham being sacrificed or attempted to be sacrificed on the altar was published in the Times and Seasons. Now, six months later, September of 1842, the editor already knows about the contents of the book of Jasher and the story that Abraham was cast into the fire of the Chaldees in that book. Once again, the quote, But if we believe in present revelation, as published in the Times and Seasons last spring, Abraham, the prophet of the Lord, was laid upon the iron bedstead for slaughter, and the book of Jasher, which has not been disproved as a bad author, says he was cast into the fire of the Chaldees. 
Once again, Times and Seasons, September 1st, 1842. So it is not just hypothetical that Joseph Smith had access to the book of Jasher during his lifetime. Here is proof that he had actual access to it. And not only that, but that the editor of the Times and Seasons, with which Joseph Smith was very much engaged as being the editor, published an article in September of 1842, which shows that even as of that date, knowledge of the book of Jasher was had among the Latter-day Saints and almost certainly by Joseph Smith, as well as this specific story contained in the book of Jasher about Abraham being cast into the fire of the Chaldees. So here's what we have. We have evidence, plain, uncontroverted evidence, that Joseph Smith and his associates had a copy of the book of Jasher. They had access to it. They read it. They knew what was in it. They knew the story about Abraham being cast into the furnace of the Chaldees. And now we get to 2019, and Kwaku, the deceiver, is publishing a video in which he does not mention any of these facts to his audience. Instead, he looks at other documents that were not available to Joseph Smith that told the same story about Abraham being cast into the fire of the Chaldees and says Joseph Smith could not have known about it by any way other than revelation. And not only that, Kwaku says that there were no other documents available to Joseph Smith that mentioned this story. That is flat out false. And if Kwaku knows, as I believe he does know, about the contents of the book of Jasher and its availability to Joseph Smith, then he is going to have a very long Temple Recommend interview with his bishop the next time it comes up for renewal. So that shows that the book of Jasher was known and available and accessible to Joseph Smith during his lifetime and could just as easily have served as a source for his story in the book of Abraham about the attempted sacrifice of Abraham in the Chaldees, as the book of Abraham says just like the book of Jasher says. What about the history of Josephus? Well, like the book of Jasher, the history of Josephus was also known and available to Joseph Smith during his lifetime. You will remember that it is Josephus that mentions that Abraham brought the knowledge of astronomy to the Egyptians. If we go back to the homepage of the Joseph Smith Papers Project, go to the search function and type in Josephus, that's J-O-S-E-P-H-U-S, we will find a number of hits for that. Actually, 12 of them come up on my computer. The first one I want to go to is the History of the Church, 1838 to 1856, volume F1. Click on that, and we will find an account of the martyrdom of Joseph Smith. We first read the familiar story from June 27, 1844, where John Taylor sings a poor wayfaring man of grief. And indeed, all the verses are contained in the history of the church. Immediately after that song ends, he spake in my poor name he named, of me thou hast not been ashamed, these deeds shall thy memorial be, fear not thou didst them unto me. When he got through, Joseph requested him to sing it again, which he did. The very next sentence, Hiram read, extracts from Josephus. Now we all know that Hiram read an extract from the Book of Mormon on the afternoon of the martyrdom and then turned down the leaf of the page that he had read, which may or may not have been the very copy of the Book of Mormon that Elder Holland held up in general conference not so long ago. But you actually have to go to the Joseph Smith Papers Project and the History of the Church to learn that Hiram also read extracts from Josephus. It doesn't say what the extracts were, but indeed, they not only knew of Josephus, Josephus was not only in English at the time of the martyrdom, they had that book with them, and Hiram read extracts from it. But it wasn't only on the afternoon of Joseph Smith's last day on earth that he knew about Josephus. It appears that knowledge of the contents of Josephus was known as early as 1837. If we go to another link that comes up under our search for Josephus, this one being the Elder's Journal for November of 1837, page 26, we find the following. The Elder's Journal, once again, was another publication of the church. The historical introduction here tells us, that as editor of the Elder's Journal, Joseph Smith was ultimately responsible for its content. That is from the historical introduction, which you can click on at the top of the page, that features page 26 from the Elder's Journal. If we scroll down there, we find this reference to Josephus. This, now I'm quoting, this, like many other things under the new institution, had its type. I mean the Urim and Thummim and breastplate of the Jewish high priests. Those shown with great splendor, as long as he who wore them was righteous. Now the quote from Josephus. Josephus says, quote, 
The one in the shape of a button on the high priest's right shoulder shined out when God was present at their sacrifices, so as to be seen by those most remote, which splendor was not before natural, to the stone." Unquote. So here in 1837, in the Elder's Journal, of which Joseph Smith was the editor, Josephus is known, it is available, it is actually being quoted here in the Elder's Journal. And you will recall that it is Josephus that tells us that Abraham brought the knowledge of astronomy to Egypt. So contrary to what Kwaku tells us, this story about Abraham bringing astrology to Egypt is not found only in the book of Abraham and other documents which were not available to Joseph Smith. They were found in documents that were available to Joseph Smith, that Joseph Smith had with him, and from which Joseph Smith quoted as early as 1837, in the case of Josephus, and as early as 1842 for the book of Jasher. So, what are we to conclude from all of this? Well, the first thing is that we have to be very careful about what it is that we listen to on the internet. We have to be very careful of our sources. Here I have to agree with the general authorities who warn the members that they need to be very careful that they get their information about the church from reliable sources, because in this instance, at least, Kwaku, the deceiver, is not reliable. He is telling things that are not true, and I very highly suspect that they are things that he knows are not true. But Kwaku, I'm going to make a personal appeal to you. If you feel that I have misrepresented you in any way, if you want to correct the record, if you want to come on this program and talk to me about your video regarding the book of Abraham and my treatment of you in this podcast, the door is wide open. You are welcome anytime, any day. You name the place, I'll be there. That's about all for tonight. Until next time, this is Radio Free Mormon, signing off the air.